And uh, we're going to move on to the next presentation by uh, Dr. Adriano Barbosa, uh, who is coming from Queen Mary University in the UK and who is going to talk about uh, multimodal patient data integration to foster machine learning. Thank you, Paula, for organizing all of this. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's my pleasure to talk for the first time in a country in Latin America out of Brazil. Actually, it's my first time in a country out of Latin America because I used to be a student in Brazil, right? And everybody knows that as a student, it's pretty much tough to travel in your own country. Uh, I moved to, to Germany and then I started my uh, endeavor on data science applied to health data sets while I was in Germany. I'm going to show it to you a little bit here. So, um, I'm based now at the Queen Mary University of London. It's part of the Health Data Research UK. It's an initiative towards data science for health data sets, as the name suggests. Um, and I'm based at the William Harvey Research Institute downtown in London, although the campus is scattered all over East London. So uh, this is where I come from. I'm from Pernambuco. So I did my PhD in Minas Gerais, and I was an associate professor at the Federal University of Paraná during uh, two years before moving to Europe. Uh, in Europe, I worked at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg uh, for my PhD sandwich. It's what we call, it could be PhD parilla or something, but in this case, it's, it's not empanadas, it's a PhD sandwich. So then I, I went to conclude my thesis at the Hohenheim University in Stuttgart, and then I ended up uh, in Berlin as a postdoc in the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine during two years and a half. Now, uh, after working for five years at the University of Luxembourg, uh, I ended up at the Charterhouse Square in London. So, uh, I have a really nice uh, opportunity here to use a lot of the concepts that were explored in the presentation before mine, because I don't need to repeat them. So then I'm gonna just illustrate them to data science applied to health. So we know that the idea is that we create uh, a kind of a knowledge lake uh, contained by data coming from different layers, for example, genomics, microbiome, et cetera, behavior or clinical tests. And all of these will try to characterize the specificity of a patient within the population. Or this could help us to understand uh, the scope of diseases into a populational overview. So that's what we want to do. The idea is that you don't treat the disease anymore, but you treat the patient based on the different characteristics that you observe on this patient in the course of the uh, disease or during the diagnosis of the disease in this patient. Uh, the idea of the NHS, that's the National Health Service in the UK, uh, is that you, you, you change from a traditional medicine to a personalized medicine so that you can look at every individual as only one case and try to approach them with the best uh, available uh, treatment. Um, so I'm going to make a parallel with different projects that I worked before to contextualize in the scope of my talk. And the first project that I'm going to talk to you is a project called Etionomy. So Etionomy is a project that was funded by IMI. In France, it's called IMI. So that's Innovative Medicines Initiative. Uh, and the idea is to reclassify uh, the etiology or the definition of neurological diseases. Uh, this came from a paper published by John Bell. It's a call to reform the taxonomy of human diseases. And then the etionomy project wanted to do this for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So the idea is that there is a limited consensus about this disease. Uh, we need to prepare for a new etiology-based classification of the disease and not anymore um, only the classical the, uh, uh, diagnosis, the classical features, but more a multimodal diagnosis of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And of course, there is a lack of meaningful causal or correlative links between what you see in the molecular level, in the histopathological, and in the clinical features of both AD and PD diseases. So for this project, I was pretty much involved in the, in the midfield. So it's not of the best uh, position for a Brazilian to play. Uh, of course, we are good strikers, or you use it to be before we lose 71 to Germany. But well, the future is bright, I'm sure about that. So uh, my position was more like here, what's this? This is a, a forward right, right, I think, I don't know, in a team. So I met many, many people in Europe on this project in the autonomy. Um, and 
the project brought, uh, brought together different players. So we had data coming from different streams in this uh, quite interesting project. So it's pretty much coming from all over Europe. I'm going to show you later on. Uh, I played on the knowledge management um, layer of this project. So the idea is that we had the work package tree as our clinical experts that use it to select the indices that would represent in a better way these diseases. So in the public, clinical, and omics domain. And then you go up to the work package five that would be our data collection core. So all these data collection people, they would collect values to fill the relevant variables to try to explain the disease. So, and all of these would come to us here, the University of uh, uh, Luxembourg, that's somewhere here, so when I was working there. And the work package two uh, received all these data sets and all this data definition from the partners here. So, they also use it to provide tools or methods to analyze all these data sets and try to integrate the multimodal uh, fashion of the data. So then what we did is like we received this data set, we curate them, we promote the curation. Everybody knows here that's a very critical step on the usage of biological information, is that we spend most of the time organizing the information and therefore afterwards using this to run your predictions. So we had a huge effort to create this and store in different database systems that would allow people to uh, query and do the data analysis for uh, asking, you know, answering different questions on the data collection layer. So basically we have a very um, dynamic integration here that I'm going to show you on the, the scope of this talk, what is the effort needed to integrate different uh, data sets, right? So um, the INSEM via ECRAN, so we have uh, Jean-Jacques Demotte here representing ECRAN, uh, is the one regulating the data collection, uh, the contact with the patients, like in the French level. We have uh, the ICM, that is the Institute of the Brain and the uh, Spinal Cord in Paris. They use it to collect the clinical data, biological specimens, and also the brain imaging data for the enrolled patients. So all of these data sets, they come to our hands, and of course they are pretty much protected via a data protection agreement, which use it to be uh, a quite complex thing. So coming from the principles that Alzheimer's disease is a very complex network, as you can see from the CAG map of this disease over here, um, the idea is that you, you, you want to expand from this specific little uh, events here as the creation of senile plagues and the neurofibrillarity tangles as the major characteristics of the disease, to try to understand in the uh, long term what are the changes that would cause this disease by using multimodal information. So you start with different uh, levels of um, impairment in, in the patients, such as AMCI or mild Alzheimer's, uh, moderated Alzheimer's, or CV Alzheimer's disease at the end of um, the, the disease progression. Um, so of course, for this, we have to integrate all this information. So what my partners did is like, they go to the PubMed. I'm not going to ask if you know what PubMed is because I assume everybody knows. So uh, the partners at the pharma industry, they had the internal data sets and they use it to provide this very raw data set to us. We have uh, the clinical data coming from the clinical centers. We have to collect the clinical assessments, demographic, et cetera, curate this information and put together with all the literature relevant data sets. So these data sets are curated in the same format and inserted in a tool called Transmart. So Transmart is a pretty much uh, versatile software that was created initially in a um, pharma context. And then afterwards it was open for the developers like me, like some of you, in order to create more functionalities for the, anal the, anal the analysis of those data sets that I showed you before. So the idea is that you've got the source data, and if you've got data guiding the relevance of this uh, information in the scope of the disease that we're interested, so you create this and then you load by using extraction, transformation, and loading uh, routines, normally a business intelligence layer, and then you load this on the Transmart data warehouse, which is a PostgreSQL 
system, which is being changed now for MongoDB, once that everybody knows it's more efficient and big data solution. Uh, and then afterwards, what you can do is to use the built-in functionalities of Transmart in order to analyze your data sets. So if you're a developer, what you can do using Transmart is to provide the, the, the development team with a plugin, and then they will plug this uh, functionality in the main core of the uh, tool, and then we will run the analysis in the way that you like. So Transmart is a very interesting system. Uh, it's a system that can uh, uh, work in a federated manner. This means you can have different applications running uh, on different servers and all connected to the same database running in one core uh, database or distribution center, let's say. <laughs> or the other way around, you can have like one application, one web application that will fetch data from different remote databases in order to, for you to run your analysis locally in the core that you selected to use. So that's the, the important thing about this federated manner. Uh, at the end of the day, what matters is really the, the conserved database structure. This means no matter what kind of data set you have, there will be a database scheme that will receive this data set and store in order to use the analytical functionalities of Transmart. Uh, this is how the tool looks like. Uh, I can put the Atrix uh, symbol here because Atrix is another IMI project that I also worked for, and it's pretty much related to etionomy. Etionomy has the scope of neurodegenerative diseases, and Atrix has the scope of providing a tool to do this data integration, Transmart, and increase the scope of the usage of this tool for all the IMI projects that they aim the integration of multiple data sets. It's a pretty easy system, so I'm not gonna play any videos because normally it crashes, and then you stay here trying to figure out why it crashed. So the idea is that you have a navigation tree on this side, you select the clinical variables that you want to compare between one, uh, one subset of patients and another one, and then you drag and drop this on this frame, and then let's say that you want to compare uh, Alzheimer's disease versus uh, control patients. Then you can run different types of analysis like plots or explore like the table, uh, I mean the, the visualize it, the data table behind the database. Uh, you can save your workspace and share with your colleagues that you collaborate in another country, for example. Uh, you can run advanced workflows here such as a volcano plot, some of you are, are familiar with that. This will give you genes that are differentially expressed between one cohort and another one. Uh, you can explore the variants associated to a specific patient on your system, etc. So we have a quite uh, suite of methods that could be used on Transmart. I've been involved in the publications of some of those resources. For example, uh, there is a, um, a tree that allow you in a standardized manner to integrate multiple data sets by using one common nomenclature uh, called uh, CDISC, SDTM. Uh, you can integrate your system Transmart with uh, bioinformatics um, workflow man management systems such as the Galaxy, or you can you know, plug in some interactive uh, methods, as I mentioned before. This is the uh, heat map implemented on the Smart R. So, and the best thing is it's free of charge. You go to GitHub, you clone the environment, and you start playing with the tool. Or if you just if you don't want to develop anything, you just download the system. It's a little bit troublesome if you don't have a computational background, but if you do, uh, you'll be able to install the tool quite well. If not, then you just download a Docker instance, and then you run on the fly on your container. So, um, of course, now we, are, we, we have data coming from different sources. We have a tool that's quite interesting. We need to manage all these people that's having access to the database. So in, in order to do that, I set up, <coughs> sorry, I have a bit of cough. <coughs> sorry. Uh, I set up in Luxembourg something called a uh, study uh, management system that allows me to talk to all the members of the projects in all the countries in Europe and then they have a specific role within the system in order to explain to the project office why they think that a study should be included in the system. So it's a quite interesting provenance system for you to control uh, the studies that will be added to the system and who should have access to those, to those data sets, right? 
of course, I'm on the center. I stole this graph model for someone famous in the internet. Uh, I, I have data coming from Germany, Spain, Netherlands, uh, again, Germany here, Fraunhofer, Sanofi, and ICM. And this goes straight to the Luxembourg University Legal Advisor, uh, also known as uh, Lula. So anyways, in this team, uh, we have a close contact with the legal team. It's a model that we use in Luxembourg. We are using now in, in, in Britain as well. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a headache because you have to set up a data sharing agreement with all the individual partners that are sending data to you. And this can take up to two years, trust me. I'm a biologist. So uh, there you get agreements. You have 31 different formats for the single project that I'm running, that I ran in the past. So my advice to you is like, be the best friend of your legal advisor, of your data protection officer, of your lawyers, because they can save your back when you have troubles. Uh, this is going to be needed, right? So, uh, of course, all of this is delayed, right? And I, I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist, I'm a bioinformatician. I want to do something cool and find some insights on my data sets. What I do, I use data sets that are open for the public, right? I use data sets for Alzheimer's and dementia, such as the ADNI and the PPMI, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or the Parkinson's Progressions Markers Initiative. So in order to do this, of course, I have to download the data to create and to load on Transmart. This is how it looks like. And then uh, I have all the features uh, described at the website of the source of those studies, right? I know like pretty much well uh, all the data points. I know pretty much well the, the groups that every patient belongs to. And I just need to explore this. The best way to explore this as a bioinformatician is to load this on R or on Python and go on. In order to do that, we are preparing an API, an application programming interface, to communicate with the database scheme of Transmath, download the data directly to the analytical environment of R, and run our analysis. So this is, for, for example, one of the machine learning analysis that I can exemplify here for you. So I have like the diagnosed groups of each patient to the until the month 72. So you can see a little distribution here, a little bit more cases of dementia. And then I have at month 72, the diagnosed status of these people, right? At month 72, there are 27 cases here that have not yet been uh, diagnosed as dementia. And Guess what we want? We want to tell that these people will develop dementia before they develop dementia. Machine learning can help us, right? A bit of a distribution of the data. So this is the difference uh, in terms of uh, the number of patients per uh, age in, each, in every visit, from visit zero, baseline to visit 120. And I'm considering only patients until visit 72. Patients that completed visit 72. So, and then of course I have the doctor diagnosed until month 72. And then I can see the distribution here of the status of this diagnosis. So I have all the features of those patients, all the results for the tests that they have been uh, subjected to. Uh, I of course need to identify those patients that they have missing information and detect those missing features. And then I have, like, unfortunately, a quite big level of a missingness on those data sets. I have to input this data, and the imputation at the end looks like this. I have from visit baseline to visit 72, some missing data. I use an algorithm called Amelia 2.0, and Amelia will help me to impute missing values on this data set. Uh, at the end of the day, what I have is, like, for every variable of my data set, such as hypocampus, I can track the trajectory of this data, uh, of this value uh, along my cohort from baseline to month 72. Uh, I use all this variable for training of my machine learning model. I compare different types of uh, machine learning uh, functions here implemented in Python scikit-learn. So logistic regression, k neighbors classifier, et cetera, et cetera, a very popular here that support vector classifier and so on. And then I select some of them to test against uh, my training data set. And this is more or less, the, uh, the, sorry, to test against my test data set. 
So I train, I measure the accuracy, I verify whether there is or not an overfitting of my model during the training phase. And afterwards, I use like a leaf, like a left, how can I say, a leaf or an additional um, separated data set for testing. And this testing will give me some interesting rock values. That's the, the value under the curve, right? Of 0.93 and 0.83 for different types of classifiers. And this is quite interesting. Uh, these are some metrics for the machine learning. Um, the idea is that as, as much as this line here goes down, this means that my cross-validation score is going a little bit down, and my model is not like overlearning or overfitting to a certain data set that I'm using for training. So, um, so this is a good thing. If, if this value would be on the top all the time here, it would look like that the value, the model is very biased for my problem. So the idea is that I really um, have a kind of a convergence to a value that's quite interesting. It's more like technical perspective on the machine learning. <coughs> so at the end, what I did is like, I tried to, to assess the diagnosis status per visit of my depleted data set and see that my dementia cases, they started to be, um, diagnosed much earlier as in comparison to visit 72. Of course, at visit 72, I have some of the, the people already um, diagnosed here, but most of them, they are already on the very beginning. I think the other one, this one is, uh, yeah, this is, this is the interesting one because this is the blind data set that I've used. So the idea is that I can start already having the predictions that this means these red dots happening much earlier as in comparison to the doctor diagnosis. So of course this is a prediction, the, doctor has to, have to, uh, the doctors, they have to look at this and see if it's consistent or not. Uh, but what I want to do is to make that all the cases that should be read, they appear at the very beginning of my study. And this is how I do this kind of analysis. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that was the doctor, the prediction, and the real diagnosis. Now, if you look at the real diagnosis, you have to wait a little bit longer to get the red bars here in the right uh, position. So very quickly, uh, some of the metrics, and I can see that I get some really interesting precision in F1 score metrics on, on the early months of my predictions. For example, month 37. I don't need to wait until month 72. I can anticipate this diagnosis. And of course, this uh, gives me a quite interesting number of uh, true positive cases when you compare here uh, the month 36. So this is my target. The method is able to predict way earlier as in comparison to the doctor uh, diagnosis. Now you can see here, <coughs> the idea is that you can reduce these cases as much as possible, as quick as possible, and the method can capture already uh, 30 cases, 13 cases at the very beginning of the curve. And this is the real diagnosis. It takes much longer for you to, to load down the number of cases that you should predict. So um, I was, I moved, then I moved to the UK. So in the UK, I was part of this initiative. And then I said, OK, now I'm interested to apply all this technology of data integration and machine learning to the UK Biobank, that you may have heard about that as well. So as a member of the Health Data uh, Science UK, I got access to all the data for this cohort in the UK. Uh, and the idea is to create a picture of the health. And you have, for example, imaging data from uh, artery, from abdomen, brain, heart, and bones and joint. So the idea is that now I don't have only a specific project for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, but I also have health people that we will start to be followed, up, followed on. And uh, the idea is that when these people, if eventually they get sick, I have a snapshot of the variables that change in the course of time. And what I tried to do now in the beginning of my project is to get all the 11,870 variables of Transmart, curate them manually, semi-automatically, of course, because as a bioinformatician, you ran the tough job on a program, and then the ones that are not so good, you go there by hand, and then you change it. But the idea is that I encapsulated the almost 12,000 variables of, of UK Biobank on Transmart. So then I can do the tricks from the beginning that I showed you. Uh, <clears throat> so then I said, OK, now we have uh, this specific project. We have the UK Biobank project. So I wrote a grant for the Corbell. 
that uh, Jean-Jacques Demotte is also one of the directors, coordinators there. Uh, and the idea is that I don't want only to use the UK biobank data, but I want to use all the cardiovascular information from all the hospitals of Europe. Uh, and this ECRAN allows us to do, uh, sorry, uh, Corbell allows us to do that because they provide access to research infrastructures all over Europe. And on my project, I have a really nice guy that allows me to query for all the types of cardiovascular images that, uh, cardiovascular data that I want in all the biobanks of Europe. It's called the BBMRI, the Biobanking and Biomolecular Research, uh, Resources Research Infrastructure. So it has access to 702 different biobanks and 1,487 collections. So now I can have access to over 100 million samples and associated data. Of course, they have the sample, the tissue, but as a bioinformatician, I want the data. Give me the data. And then let's see what we can do with that. Um, da, da, da. This one. Uh, so one of the data sets that I'm interested, as I showed you before, to match with the UK Biobank are the imaging data. And the imaging data, I'm having a really nice support of uh, Stephen Clyde that's sitting over there. He's one of our partners, and he'll speak to us a little bit more about that later. Uh, the idea is that we have the imaging data in DICON from these patients, and once I receive that, there will be a quite interesting pipeline uh, that we might use at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam to extract values from those images and then use these values as biomarkers of disease progression, for example. Um, so these are some of the biobanks that um, signalize it to us as having data to be integrated in our system. I'm quite glad that Corbell is supporting this project because we don't need to pay for the usage of the research infrastructure. and they give me some uh, funding to go and visit Stefan uh, there in Rotterdam and have some nice time at his group and learn a lot about how to use XNAT, for example. So uh, in order to access for this kind of uh, grant, you need to write your research plan. And then what I want at the end is to receive European data to run like a um, dimensionality reductions techniques on those data sets, such as PCA, and then, of course, classify my patients, for example, using machine learning, such as SVM. Um, yeah, so I tried in this very brief time to cover some of the projects that I worked, and I worked in the last six years. Uh, I talked about etionomy, data integration of neurodegenerative diseases data, Atrix, about providing Europe with a translational uh, medicine infrastructure, uh, ADNI, how to apply machine learning to predict Alzheimer's disease onset. Uh, HDI UK, for integrate the UK biobank data sets with Transmart and then make this kind of data model available to the public. And finally, how to use Corbell to have access to research infrastructure in Europe for all of these projects and future projects to come. So this is some of the people that work together with Mike Barnes, our director. So that's uh, Katriana, Chris, and there is Claudia, Daniel, and Ethan. Uh, it's a lot of support, of course. Uh, I did not list here the people from the Theonomy and the Atrix projects. These are like millions of people. Uh, they, they, they are very nice to work. And of course, there are conflicts. But everywhere, there are conflicts. So I have to manage these conflicts. And nowadays, the people that they are funding my research in the UK. Um, a big thanks to, 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 to the organizers of the meeting and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about my, my work here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriano. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions, so I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah, go ahead. We have the control on, on the Alzheimer's disease uh, data. This is the one. So uh, this is the one. So this is a blind data set, and these are people that they started the the, the study as control. They they were healthy people, and looking until the month 132 after recruit, uh, recruitment, they did not develop the disease. 
So, and this is how the predictions, they render. You can see that there are no uh, red dots there. So these are the group. They should not be classified as uh, dementia. Some of them, they have a mistake there as being classified as mild cognitive impairment, but they really don't transit to dementia. So if you see at the MCI, MCI, there are people that they started as control, but at the end of the study, I, I know that they developed MCI. That's why they belong to this uh, group here. And then you can see that some cases, they, um, they have a prediction as Alzheimer's disease. In those cases, I don't have this slide here, unfortunately, it's on my other presentation, but what I could verify is that they are heterozygosis for APOE. And APOE is a very key gene for, gene for Alzheimer's disease. This means that um, some of the cases really have to look at this to see if they are MCI or not. But in, in general aspects, I think that the control group is pretty much good there. So, yeah, I wanted to know why the MCI is not AD. Maybe it's just not di diagnosed yet as AD. The studies are still conducted. Hi. Um, question. How you uh, use the controls, the same standard? Because when you analyze the big data like that, the standard of collection of the data are not so easy. Biobank is one of the example. When you put it together, the data, you need to drop a lot of sample because they, they are not in the same standard. This is one. Um, and the APOE for this case is the most important. And the, yes, how you weight this compared to with the other that is not so relevant to the disease. These are two very relevant questions. Thank you very much. Uh, the first one, uh, we, we uh, regarding the standards, in the ADNI study, uh, they have all the standards normalized across the centers. So if you go to the website of ADNI, they have, for example, for the imaging data, they have what they call the phantom. This means that all the machines, they will be normalized by using the same like phantom data set prior to the data collection. And they follow the same protocol on the ADNI study and also on the UK Biobank somehow. The BARTS Bioresources, which is another data set at the work, is a little bit different, it's heterogeneous. I don't have a lot of uh, results about that. But for the UK Biobank, most of the variables they follow, there is no med city, um, it's no med city, that's how it's called, uh, in terms of data annotation. So there is, a, there is a, a trial in order to normalize the information before it's made available to all the researchers. The second question about the APOE, uh, the way I encode this is the, lock, loss, the locus status, whether this is um, heterozygosis uh, in, in double recessive or double dominant. So. <coughs> Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I don't wait. I don't wait myself, but the classifier, when it compares the groups and it sees that this feature is very relevant to distinguish the groups, it gives a bigger, what we call the, the, the relevance of the, there is another term for that. The, um, the feature relevance, if I'm not wrong, feature significance. Yeah, on the rank. You have a rank on the way back, no? saying about uh, how much is, the, is that variable important in order to distinguish your training data sets. So this is what they call the, the, the feature relevance. Uh, on the other case, if you need to run the dimensionality reduction, then you have the, the vectors, what, which is called the, the component vectors, component vectors that will indicate the weight of every variable in the principal component that tries to explain the variance observed on your data set. These are the two metrics that you can extract from the data afterwards. But myself, I don't give any kind of weight for that variable in the beginning. You're welcome. I think we have, yeah, one more question. <laughs> Just Questions. First of all, thanks a lot. It was a very impressive talk. Uh, the first question was already anticipated there. It was about 
like data standardization. From what you said, I understand that data standardization is done by the center who participate through agreeing into common standards, or there's some work from the person who received the data? There is some work. Okay. Yeah. We have a data creation. Is it a lot of work? It's because a lot of work. Okay, good. That's, yeah. that's what I'm expecting. A lot of work. Second question is then, when you have, um, if you want to do something different from all the procedures you have, uh, like standard on this data set, how easy it is to design your own procedure and run it into your framework? So you don't need to change the tool, which is good. You don't need mm -hmm. to change the database structure. It's amazing. What you need to do is to create your own uh, clinical and uh, multidimensional uh, mapping files, what we call the standard mapping files of Transmart. Mm -hmm. So this is what you need to do. In my case, I wanted to use a UK biobank to load in Transmart. I created my customized UK biobank clinical map ma mapping file. Okay. So this is a, a data creation uh, you know, task that you don't necessarily need to have a, a computational skill to do that. It's more a domain expertise. Yeah, okay, but I was meaning more if, if you want to do a certain kind of analysis on data who are already curated, and you want to do a new analysis, no, is that That's poss fine. That's, that's possible that's because easy. you can extract via the API and plug in on your, on your analytical data flow. Thank you. We can talk more about this later.